as, as books are published, um, there's a cycle. When I started it, it was the emerging crisis. I will now spend the next three months changing tenses. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here, um, particularly 100 years after the beginning of the First World War. I would love to say something pithy comparing this moment to August 1914, but I can't. They're different, except in this sense. History continues. There was an illusion, if you will, that dominated the past generation, that somehow we human beings had escaped the human condition, that the only matter that we really had to think about right now was harmonizing tuna fishing in the South Seas. Well, life is not that easy, and history is not that easy. And so we are now at a moment, literally, where we begin to consider what the future will hold. To do that, we have to begin with the past. And to that, we have to understand that we are at the end of the post-Cold War world. The world that began with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Japanese economic miracle that would suppress the United States any time, Tiananmen Square, which defined what China was going to be, the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, Operation Desert Storm. All of these occurred within a year of 1991. And it framed the world that was built on three pillars. The first was the United States, the world's largest economy, and the only really global power, unique in its military capabilities. The second was Europe, coming together in a way it had never come together before, promising not merely to be a free trade zone, but to emerge as, ultimately, the United States of Europe, an enormously wealthy, powerful region, counterbalancing the United States. The third pillar was China. In each generation since World War II, there has been a low-wage, high-growth country that grew at a phenomenal rate. With the decline of Ch Japan, China filled fully that, that position. I shouldn't say decline of Japan. Japan is still very much with us. Um, this was the pillar of our world, these three countries, each operating differently, Europe is not a country, but a collection of countries, each having a different mechanism, each playing a different game. Between August 8th, 2008, and September 15th, 2008, this world began going to pieces. On August 8th, 2008, Russia announced its return to history by invading Georgia, or by being forced to invade Georgia, or whatever story we want. But what happened was that the assumption that Russia was no longer a nation state capable of making itself felt on its periphery was proven wrong. What else Russia would become was something to be discussed. And on September 15th, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And with the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, although that's a symbol more than the crucial event, the international financial system that really had governed throughout this entire period came under tremendous pressure and began changing the way in which the world worked. These two are related, not in the sense that the Russians invaded because of Lehman Brothers, or Lehman Brothers fell because of the Russians, but it was at this moment that the things that we took for granted about the post-Cold War world began to dissolve. And the world began changing very quickly. Of the changes, by far the most important was the change in Europe. It suffered the greatest effects of the American 
subprime debt crisis. The reasons are complex and simple. At the center of the European Union is a country that exports the equivalent of 40% of its GDP, sometimes less. It is addicted to exports. Its industrial plant, its economy is too large for domestic consumption. And if those exports fall, unemployment, the primordial failure of Germany, would be there. Under these circumstances, the possibility of countries like Romania, like Spain, of being able to maintain their balance in the face of a financial crisis was limited. Europe did extremely well during times of prosperity. I know of no entity that ever managed prosperity better. But that was not the measure of an entity, whether a multinational nation. It is how it handles adversity. And in 2008, it experienced the first wash of adversity. And the question was how to handle the sovereign debt problem. Because as economies contracted, in some, their ability to manage not just sovereign debt, but corporate debt and individual debt became a challenge. Some had deep pockets and managed it well. Some had very shallow pockets. And there was this tremendous crisis. And Europe had to face a decision. The debtors decided the burden should be borne by the creditors. The creditors decided the burden should be borne by the debtors. Strange compromises were reached. But in the end, it was the debtors who had to make up the problem. Both sides had a narrative of what happened. The German narrative was that the wily Greeks had outwitted them by lying about their economic condition. The Greek position was, yes, we very easily fooled Deutsche Bank examiners, <coughs> who are very simple people and can't tell it. But really, that the Germans wanted to maintain consumption within the EU and lent a great deal of money. As with geopolitics, we can argue the morality or the propriety either way, even the facts. But we have this fact now. Germany has less than 6% unemployment. Greece has 26% unemployment. Spain has 26% unemployment. The Mediterranean Europe is in the grip of a depression. I say depression for two reasons. First, these were numbers very similar to what the United States had during its Great Depression of the 1930s. Second, the Depression has a consequence when it destroys institutions able to take stimulus and turn into wealth. In the United States, throughout the 1930s, it was impossible to really stimulate the economy. Why? So many businesses had gone bankrupt. So many banks were not functioning that the mechanisms for stimulating the economy were simply not there. In Spain, 53% of all construction companies have gone bankrupt. If you want a highway building program in Spain, you'll have to do it with the government. And that is not as stimulating as you might want. You now have a Europe that does not share a fate. The life of a Mediterranean and the life of an Austrian or a German are utterly different. This was not a country to begin with, but a multinational exercise. And history has diverged so profoundly that it's very difficult to find the common root of them both. The crisis of Europe is in the end a social crisis, but it's a social crisis of a particular sort. In what sense can we say that Europe shares a common fate when the Mediterranean region is in, is in catastrophic crisis? Germany and Austria are doing quite well. The French and the Italians are at 10% or higher unemployment. <laughs> 
And in the East, from Poland to Bulgaria, they are confronting not an economic problem, but a geopolitical problem. Suddenly, the Russians are back. There is no common sense of what should be done in the East. The parallel entity that we speak about NATO is in no position by itself to take action that's meaningful. Remember, a military crisis is, by definition, something that has a military. Um, you have a massive divergence in what it means to be European. This is new. The history of Europe has been a massive divergence in what it means to be human. But the experiment that intended, and I use this word carefully because it's constantly used by the Europeans, harmonize the European experience has clearly been lost. Your expectation of your life, if you're Spanish or Greek or from Southern Italy, and your expectation of life, if you're French, your expectation of life, if you're Polish, if your expectation of life, if you're German, these are now very different. The institutions continue to meet, they continue to function, but when President Hollande meets Chancellor Merkel, it is the President of France meeting the Chancellor of Germany, not two leaders of Europe. Each have their own agenda, each have their own interests. In other words, we cannot say that Europe failed, it's still there, but it is not functioning as anyone expected to function, and I think that most advocates of Europe expected it. And out of this has emerged at the last election what was inevitable, massive radical parties. There is another huge disjuncture in Europe that really must be addressed. The disjuncture between the Eurocrats, the elite, if you will, and the mass. When I come to Europe <clears throat> and I talk to people from what I call the Financial Times circle, where it's a fine newspaper, but that circle, they keep telling me we're doing much better, our banks are this, and we really are stressed as of that, and it's wonderful. The fact that masses of Southern Europeans are in personal catastrophe, or as someone told me the other day, uh, from The Economist, uh, there is movement here. The answer is, to save Southern Europe, you don't need a movement, you need an earthquake. This is a generational event and a catastrophe. And therefore, it is inevitable that two things will happen, that radical movements, and when the middle class is the one that's targeted, it will be a right-wing movement, will emerge, and that the elite will first dismiss them as unimportant, and then try to understand where they came from. So, one of the pillars of the post-Cold War world has changed its behavior. The 2008 crisis hit China directly. The problem of any exporting country, the, the, the weakness of export efficiency is your customer is not buying. And this is partly the Chinese story. It is also that the Chinese are committed for political reasons to full employment. As such, they are prepared to lend enormous amounts of money through various mechanisms to make sure that bankruptcies do not go completely out of hand, creating unemployment, because the Chinese Communist Party was created out of the unemployment in Shanghai in the 1920s. They remember what that can do. This, in turn, creates inflation. This is a simple model, but it has elements of truth to it. So the Chinese goods are not competitive on the international market. And therefore, you see the movement of Chinese factories out of China to places like Latin America, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, and so on. When the Ch Japanese began buying real estate in the United States at the same time that everybody was declaring them magnificent, I raised the question then, if they're so magnificent, why would they buy real estate in the United States? And the answer was because they knew something as insiders frequently do, which it was time to get out. You see similar capital flight of Ch out of China, and not only capital flight, but industrial flight, which is somewhat different. China is now officially, by the Chinese numbers, growing at about 7.5%, substantially less than before. And Chinese statistics are always something to be 
look at in wonder. You can say this much. China is not what it was in, 2000, in uh, 1991. The future is not the same. The United States, in the meantime, has discovered the difference between overwhelming power and omnipotent power. <laughs> the experience of the United States in Iraq and in Afghanistan, in North Africa and elsewhere, has driven home the fact that the model of warfare that the United States developed in general in the 20th century works much better than the model they found here. The United States' ultimate power was not undermined in Iraq and Afghanistan, but as the father of a child who did two tours of duty in Iraq, I can tell you I was not happy. We did not have a reason to be doing this. So the United States had a model that it pursued consistently during the 20th century, first. Go to war in a context of an alliance structure. And by that we mean an alliance structure that has enormous military capability for which a marginal input will give it greater help. Second, go in as late as possible. Third, go in as heavy as possible. The First World War is a perfect example. The United States did not intervene and declare war until 19. 17, three weeks after Tsar Nicholas abdicated, when it became obvious that the Germans might be able to withdraw their forces from the Eastern Front. And at this point, the United States, within a year, a little over a year, sent about a million men. It had an alliance structure into which to insert itself. It was coming very late in the war, not early, and it came with overwhelming force. In World War II, we saw something very similar. The United States nibbled around the edges in North Africa or Italy. But it did not intervene until the Soviet Union had exhausted the Wehrmacht. And then it intervened overwhelmingly in Northern Europe in June 1944 and brought the war with the Russians to a close within a year. In the Cold War, it was the Bundeswehr the German mil military, that was the primary exposed force, not the United States. The United States was the reserve. And the United States guaranteed that if there was a war, we would intervene. And maybe we would, and maybe we wouldn't. I suspect the American presidents didn't know. But certainly, we held our options open. And so we now live in a world where the United States is going back to practicing its old philosophy. And it does so in the sense of the emergence of Russia, and I might add of Germany, as new and independent players. The emergence of Russia had to do with two events. The American absorption in the Iraqi, Afghan, and other wars, it was diverted that created a window of opportunity, and the weakness of Europe. The weakness of Europe meant that it risked little militarily if it acted, but it did not have to act because it could use its commercial, what I call commercial imperialism, to achieve its ends. Obviously, it didn't have to trick the Europeans into becoming dependent on its natural gas. It merely had to make certain that the Europeans had no reason to fear becoming dependent on its natural gas. And they did very well at that. They still do. Uh, the European divisions meant that if something were to happen at some point, the Poles might be upset, but the Spaniards were not ready to go to war. The division of interests, of geopolitical interests of the European powers was so dramatic that in some in Europe, you raise the question of Ukraine, and they say, what Ukraine? And in others, they lose sleep every night over what's happening. It is extremely important to understand that geopolitical shifts do not take place because one power rises. 
it's also necessary that other powers fall. And this is what we've been seeing. We need to speak of Ukraine for a moment. What happened in Ukraine, in my point of view, was a massive defeat for the Russians. It was skilled, a lot. it was the fact that the United States wanted to portray it as Russian aggression. And Moscow also wanted to portray it as Russian aggression. That nobody wanted to admit what had actually happened. That has led us to this strange psychological moment. But in fact, the Russians suffered a massive defeat. They had a pro-Russian president. One morning he was evicted and left. They essentially lost control of Ukraine. They held on to a sliver where they had to in Crimea. They didn't invade it. They were there. They were in control. And they fight in places like Kharkov or Donetsk in the east, little skirmishes. From the Russian point of view, rightly or wrongly, this was a continuation of the Orange Revolution, which they felt was a movement by Western intelligence agencies to create a pro-Western government in Kiev. 2008, and Georgia had more to do with Kiev than with Tbilisi. The Russians demonstrated in 2008, this is what an American guarantee is worth. And the audience for this was the rest of the former Soviet Union. Here, we continued <coughs> the story. For the Russians, they survived Hitler not because of winter, but because of space. The buffer zones that existed allowed the Wehrmacht to grind itself to dust alongside of Napoleon or Kaiser Wilhelm. It was depth, the depth of Russia that mattered. An example. Assume the impossible, which is that the European Union would accept Ukraine as a member, or the insane, that NATO would accept Ukraine as a member, and that Article 5 would apply to them. Um, certainly Belarus, sandwiched between the Baltics and Ukraine, could be. Well, if this entire buffer zone was lost, Smolensk, which had been at the center of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, would now be a border town. And the distance from the border to Moscow would be 250 miles. No Russian, and we spend a great deal of time on Putin's psychology, which interests me very little, no Russian leader would look at this circumstance and accept it if he didn't have to. Now, the question ultimately is, do the Russians have to? The Russians believed that the United States fomented the events in Kiev. Our Secretary Newland went there and made phone calls and gave cookies out, which if it was a conspiracy, it was a very open one. But there was no question that however they called it, the United States wanted this outcome in Kiev, nor that the Russians did not want this outcome in Kiev. So the question from their point of view is what is to be done? The Russian solution is to wait. You can never go wrong counting on the Ukrainians doing something bad to themselves. Their assumption is, first, there is no government that can function. Second, even if you get a government together, the ministries don't work. And third, they do need natural gas, and the Europeans aren't going to provide any. In this entire story, with the Russians trying desperately to find their balance again, to find some sort of standpoint which they can operate, the Germans come in. Because once again, the German question becomes vital. The Germans are the fourth largest economy in the world, the largest in Europe, and they've chosen not to have an army. It is not irrational from their point of view. The Germans have no desire for another Cold War. They may have started it by offering some silly proposal that Ukraine start thinking about joining 
the European Union, but they were sure the Ukrainians understood that they didn't mean it. But Germany now, at best, is neutral in this, willing to work out a relationship with the Russians. At worst, hostile, certainly to the intervention of the United States, because the last thing they need to their east are the Americans inventing new conflicts, as they would think about it. <clears throat> During this period of time, the President of the United States will go to Poland. The Vice President of the United States has already visited Romania. The Vice President of the United States, uh, the Secretary of Defense of the United States, uh, is going to visit next week, I think it is, and the head of the CIA. You can't do better. The Vice President, Secretary of Defense, and the head of the CIA are all visiting you publicly. Do you want to wave a red flag in front of the Russians' eyes? This will do it. And the Americans are waving it. It is clear to the Americans that this war, Cold War, and it, they, I don't think they expect a military shooting war again, will be waged in the Black Sea. Why? First, Sevastopol, for the same reason the Russians had to hold Crimea. Second, oil pipelines. The question of Georgia now becomes vitally important because Azerbaijan cannot replace Russian energy, but is a piece of replacing Russian energy and heavily influences Turkey and so on of what it can do. Not accidentally, Abkhazia is suddenly unstable. It's not clear who's destabilizing it, but everybody's having a good time. The Georgia question emerges again. If Georgia's cut off, Azerbaijan is isolated. It sells its goods through Russia, or not at all. And when you talk to the Azeris, they're very aware of the map. They know what it looks like. So <clears throat> when, we go, when I go to Poland, when I go to Romania, more to Poland, the Poles want to know what we're going to do for the Poles. And I try to answer them by saying, nothing. What are you going to do for yourself? The issue here is the United States does not intervene without allies. Allies who have substantial skin in the game, as we Americans say. The Poles say, we will have 2% of GDP. To which I said, when did 2% become a holy principle? You have enough defense to defend yourself. I don't know how much you need but I don't think it's 2%. Eastern Europe is trying to come to terms with the fact that under the American strategy, they will be as responsible for themselves as the Germans were during the first Cold, Cold War. Psychologically, with the exception of Romania, which I think gets it, doesn't mean they'll do what they're supposed to, but they get it. The United States expects massive shifts in the way in which its three main potential allies in the region behave, and that is Poland, Romania, and Turkey. Now, this is the alliance from hell, to try to get the Turks to behave one way, the Romanians to keep their word, and the Poles not to sing spiritual songs. I mean, this is hard because they each respond very differently. In the case of the Cold War, Germany was doing what it did best, it formed an army. This is harder. And so now we are back at the point where we were before. The borderland between the European Peninsula and the European heartland, between Russia and whatever our powers are to the West, is once again not in flames, but certainly has a sore throat, as I do. Um, what is to happen here? Well, as happened three times in the 20th century, the Americans are considering their next action. As has happened many times, everybody now turns their eyes to Germany and says, what is to be done? And the Germans do not want to leave the post-Cold War period, because it was wonderful for them. Not just economically, but also spiritually. They could be a power without being oppressive. 
and they want to be that. It is not that they don't want to share the burden. But on the other hand, they are not going into an other American-led war. So here in Serbia, it is an interesting question of what happens to you. You will get caught up in it somehow or another. I mean, if not because others pull you in, it's because you will pull yourselves in. You, you will get involved. To you, the question is Bulgaria, a question <coughs> which for the United States is a complete question mark, and very frankly, strategically, I think the United States has written Bulgaria off. We started Romania, we skipped Turkey, what happens to Bulgaria happens. But given the dynamics of Bulgaria at any given time, then our eyes slide slightly to the west, and there you are. The American Defense Department doesn't think that fast. The CIA may, but they don't have power over this. But the considerations are already there. And besides, we already have maps. <laughs> we are now at a turning point. 2008 began the process. We have now decisively entered a new period. Because if you go to Washington, you will recognize the change. I'll give you an example. There was a dinner for the Azerbaijanis in Washington. Chuck Schumer showed up, and he declared that there are two great democracies in the world, the United States and Azerbaijan. <laughs> He's a Democratic senator. We looked at him, but he was very happy that night, so we went on. Even more significant, the next night, Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House, leader of the Democrats, she showed up from a district full of Armenians. You have a change of fundamental structure when it's not only John McCain looking to start bombing somebody. That's his immediate response to anything. But when two very senior, very powerful, and very sober Democrats feel they need to praise Azerbaijan. Washington has done one of those sudden changes, and it has to be taken very seriously. And the president is going to Poland. The vice president is going to Romania. The meetings, the thumb, thumb, thumb. <coughs> and I can assure you that at Fort Monroe, where we do war games, all the war gamers are delighted to be pulling out old war games and studying what is to be done. And so history is returned. It is not over. And if I have time for any questions, or <coughs> there are some questions uh, you'd like to ask? I'll help you with the moderating of the questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Friedman. It was uh, it was really fascinating. It was a very <coughs> sharp analysis and uh, and some very uh, picturesque descriptions of uh, what's currently going on in the world, what's going on in D.C. and uh, and in some of the other capitals. Uh, we will now going to open the floor for for questions. And I see the first question from the audience is uh, Professor Predrag Simic, former ambassador of Serbia to Paris, amongst many other things. Mr. Friedman, it is a, a great pleasure and honor to have you in Belgrade. Uh, we learned about your name in uh, difficult days of uh, 1999, when Stratfor was one of the rare uh, sources of information on uh, uh, US uh, thinking. Uh, just uh, two brief questions. Uh, you have mentioned uh, two important dates of uh, 2008. Uh, I think that one can a a add a third date, 17th of February, declaration of independence of Kosovo and uh, recognition by bulk of uh, Western countries. Uh, that was evoked only six months later in uh, uh, Georgian uh, crisis uh, uh, when practically it backfired because this, that principle, that precedent was applied to Ossetia and Abkhazia. And uh, this spring we saw it uh, backfired with full scale because in declaration of uh, independence of uh, Crimea and Sebastopol, the first sentence was exactly uh, invocation of, uh, of the, that Kosovo precedent. Uh, so, uh, do you really think that uh, uh, that was a wrong move uh, uh, to set such a precedent that practically would be uh, claimed by all separatist uh, uh, 
in, in the world. And just briefly, since uh, we have Mr. Yeremic as a former uh, president of uh, General Assembly, uh, it seems that the uh, idea of global NATO that was characteristic not just for Ivo Daldir but also for Clinton administration and we felt it uh, here in 1999 in, uh, in Afghanistan as well. Uh, don't you think that the uh, United States uh, after the fall of Berlin uh, Wall missed a great chance to restore uh, UN organization uh, exactly where it was uh, in April 1945 or in Atlantic Charter? And uh, don't you think that uh, exactly at this point we are missing United Nations? Practically at the time of crisis, we are missing uh, the organization that was built by US liberals from Woodrow Wilson onward uh, exactly to tackle such situations. Simply uh, in Ukrainian crisis and elsewhere, uh, we can hear even a word, uh, uh, a letter uh, UN. Uh, so those are my two questions. Thank you very much. I think does it work? Yeah. In a sense, the Kosovo example gave the Russians the opportunity to say, we are operating within precedent. But I don't think the Russians, if they were operating without precedent, wouldn't have done it. Because they needed to do this in Crimea, and they can invent the precedent or not. I think the Kosovo operation was a mistake from the beginning. But not necessarily because, because of this, the Russians could do that. The United Nations issue is more interesting. During the Cold War, the United Nations could not operate because two overarching powers had to agree on any operation. And the United Nations became actually more useful after the Cold War when it became possible for them to operate in parts of the world where no one cared. So no one cared in the sense that I don't want the UN here because if the UN is here, something will happen with my main adversary. There was no main adversary. Um, we now move into a period where it is possible, and I'm not prepared to say that it will happen, that the greatest power, the United States, and a great regional power, Russia, will be dueling over some of those valuable real estate in the world, the European Peninsula. The United Nations has the tools for facilitating conversations that no one else has, but it does not have the tools for stopping two nations like Russia or the United States from doing something in their national interest. This is the inherent weakness of the United Nations, and it is one that will you know, go on. It, it's not a question of moral authority of the United Nations. It, has no, it simply has to do with the fact that nations do not allow their national interest to be violated by multinational organizations. So I think we've been in the golden age of the United Nations since 91, and it'll be interesting what will happen in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Friedman. Uh, first, uh, Christopher Clark, and then Prime Minister Aziz. Well, thank you very much. I thought that was an absolutely brilliant presentation. I mean, you really gave the, the, this, this very important period up to where we're standing now, a kind of historical gestalt, which is, which is really amazing. But my question is, uh, it's very interesting when you speak of this turning point. I think Berlin is very, very aware of this moment as a turning point. They feel very exposed. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of domestic pressure. Um, there's quite a lot of anti-American feeling. You think of the, the huge scale of the, the response to the NSA affair, which is out of proportion to the reactions anywhere else in Europe. Um, and I'm wondering what you would, if the Berlin government were to, were to hire you, which I think they should, and ask you to advise them about how they can either keep on living their dream of power without oppression or play some sort of you know, constructive role in, this, in the world order which is just beginning to emerge at this point, what would you tell them? Well, first, I wouldn't tell them to go charging in with the Americans. They've done that. That's not pleasant. There's a geographical quirkiness to look at. If you take a look at a map of Germany and Austria, if both of them remain neutral or hostile to any American action, then all supplies must come in through the Mediterranean and through northern Italy, uh, the Slovenian line, and it becomes very complicated. <coughs> 
The Germans do not want to be drawn into this. They don't see what they have to gain. They see they have a great deal to lose. And from a social point of view, their ability to build a military force rapidly is limited. But they have a tremendous bargaining chip with the Americans and a bargaining chip with the Russians. With the Americans, the fact is that supplying an Eastern Front without German Austrian cooperation becomes logistically very difficult. With the Russians, they have the carrot of German technology and investment. And the Russians also have another carrot, um, which is natural gas and so on. This is a time for the Germans to do what they do worst, practice a subtle balance of power. <laughs> but historically, if you think of these times, they always fall one way or the other too fast. So what I would advise them to do if I were a German is different from what I would advise them to do as an American. As an American, I would say, build up that military, get on board, and you know, go east, young man. <laughs> Well, that's the American side. The German side is their hesitation makes perfect sense. And I think they should do it. Thank you very much. Uh, Prime Minister Shaqat Aziz. Thank you for a very lucid presentation. Two quick questions. One, uh, could you care to comment on how much the conduct of foreign policy and perception of the United States changes when you move from a Republican government to a democratic government, keeping in mind uh, the, uh, the current situation. Secondly, do you think there's a danger that we overinterpret who shows up at which reception? Is that the work of a conscious policy message being given to a country, or the work of a good lobbyist in Washington? Well, there are many good lobbyists in Washington. This particular one, I think, had to do with a poll taken by the Democratic Party which showed that under the current circumstances, they were going to be devastated in midterm elections. The health care issue, rightly or wrongly, has hurt them a great deal and other issues. For various reasons, the polls also say that the Americans have resonated to Ukraine. They see it as an illegitimate act. They see it as a range of things. And the polls said that if the Democratic Party were to both oppose a vigorous stance on Ukraine and the post health care, that Nancy and Chuck could go home and open a candy store. These are very smart politicians. They're the smartest there is in Washington. They were not manipulated into anything. They knew exactly what they were doing, what the price would be, and what they're hoping to get. Um, the perception of the United States, depending on administrations, I find that in Europe, the perception of the United States is consistently the same. We're very naive, we're very simple-minded, we're cowboys, and why aren't we here being doing more? So between the cowboy and why aren't we doing here more? The United States will be condemned whatever it does. Uh, partly it's the European psyche, for example, wanting to feel better about its decline. It's very good to look at the United States as weak. As I pointed out when I got irritated at a Romanian interlocutor, I said, look, guy, we won three wars in Europe in the last century. How did you do? The idea that the United States is somehow naive, simple-minded, and not very sophisticated is an idea that's current, but I don't know where it comes from. We do have mistakes. We do, well, but when we get involved, we are fairly effective. Whether or not the Democrats look less competent than the Republicans, I mean, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, it's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, I think, a question that really the United States, more than any other country, is less driven by individuals and personalities, although they may be big. But there are vast bureaucracies and institutions from intelligence through foreign policy, defense department, moving in certain directions. And so I would argue that, in general, I'm not really interested in personalities and politics, uh, probably because I have no personality. <laughs> but more to the point, 
I do not I'm more interested in the institutional compulsions. And if there's any country driven by institutional compulsions, it's the United States. It sometimes does things it doesn't even think of that turns out good or bad. Well, thank you. Uh, I am going to use this opportunity to, uh, to ask the last question, which then can neatly tie into the, uh, to our next panel, which is going to be the panel on the Middle East. Uh, you uh, haven't spent too much time this time talking about the Middle East, obviously. A lot of things are going on there, and, uh, and this uh, geopolitical dynamics uh, that you're describing and, uh, in the Eurasian and the Euro-Atlantic uh, theater of significance is certainly going to have its implication on the Middle East. So uh, I know it's a, it's a topic that could uh, make you have another speech of uh, 45 minutes or an hour and a 45 minutes, but uh, perhaps we can use your answer to this as an introduction to our next panel. Now, first, 9-11 kind of artificially created importance in the Middle East that wouldn't have been there other, under other circumstances. The Middle East now is actually more important than it was because Putin and Russia are dependent on the price of oil in many critical ways. They do not control that. Right now you have the picture of Iraqi oil potentially coming to market, Iranian oil potentially coming to market, rumors and myths about American oil coming to market. If Putin stays awake at night, after he worries about the Ukraine, the thing he worries about is the price of energy. He can maintain a control of energy sales in Europe, but at a price that can't sustain his national budget or other things. So I think the United States now is very, very interested in things like Libya, Iraq, Iran, in ways they weren't six months ago. And in that sense, this is an old game showing itself again. Now, I've asked two leading experts on energy what the total output of the Middle East and oil would be, and they disagreed with each other. In, in other words, getting a coherent answer on this question that stands up to scrutiny isn't there. That's the worst thing for the Russians, to be in a position that they don't know, no one knows, and they're the ones most at risk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Friedman.